start this episode of Kappa Press with a segment called Never Have I Ever. So this segment is a twist on a popular party game but hopefully nobody gets into an existential crisis here. And to play Never Have I Ever, I'm going to list a couple of questions. If you've done the action in question, you take a sip out of your mug. And if both of you haven't, I take a sip out of my mug. Now legal says we aren't allowed to keep scores and all of us are winners anyway, but we'll see what happens, right? Are you ready to play Never Have Fair I Ever? Fair enough, let's do this. Let's go. All right. This is your first question. Never have I ever struck up a marketing partnership that I instantly regretted. <laughs> Very interesting. Okay. I hope your team's watching this as well. And that takes us to the next question of never have I ever. Called myself a fool for choosing to be a marketer. Okay. All right. The next question of Never Have I Ever. Try to use content as a duct tape to fix a bigger marketing problem. Yep. Yeah, I like my coffee. <laughs> Interesting. Chris, I hope your team clearly is watching. Well, Moving I hope my on. content team is watching. <laughs> Moving on to the next question. Never Have I Ever passed on leads that are clearly not leads to the sales team. Brett, I see you. How far I back? See Brett. <laughs> Brett was thirsty. All right. Okay. That's one way to put it. This brings us to the last question of Never Have I Ever. Are you ready for the last question? Bring it. Yes. Okay. This is going to be interesting. Never Have I Ever lied through my teeth on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, uh, I see you yet uh, again. <laughs> okay. I, I, I Hopefully that changes I mean, on the show. I haven't drunk yet. I'm thinking of that. Uh, <laughs> okay. That might have been a lie. <laughs> okay. We never know. But anyway, gentlemen, thank you so much for being such sports. With that, we've officially kickstarted today's episode on Kapapris. Thank you so much for being here. Really excited to see how the conversation goes. Thanks for having Looking us. Looking forward to it. Yeah. So, you know, the question right now for everybody is what is your association to content? Because everything we're going to be talking moving forward in this episode is going to be around content. So I'm just going to skip the formal intros and ask you again, Brett and Chris, what is your association to content in your everyday jobs? So I guess I'll start. Um, content is uh, really uh, the focal point for everything that I do and we do at The Juice. Um, we are a small growing business that is actively trying to get our name out there, share our point of view, collaborate with other like-minded individuals in the space. And we do this through content. So whether it's regularly writing articles that share our point of view, hosting our podcast, Modern Day Marketer, where we're bringing on other marketers to help educate um, and also just creating deliverables for our sales team. Um, when we're, when we're, you're small, you're scrappy, um, content has really been our opportunity to try to break through and not only build our brand, but share our perspective for where we're going as a business. Mm -hmm. That's my I, I mean, I, I echo most of what Brett said. I mean, as a marketer on the, the side of me that does business at a company, uh, content is at the center of everything. I can't think of really any leads that we generate, any pipeline that's created that doesn't start with a piece of content, wherever it is in, in, in the funnel. Um, but from there, we're also a content company. So we help big businesses align their tone of voice, clarity, consistency to drive more impact out of their content. So it's important to me to create good and important content because I understand what I'm trying to do with it. We're also trying to help our customers do the same thing. That is very interesting. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think that with that, we're moving on to the next segment 
which I'm really looking forward to. This one's called The Curiosity Room. In The Curiosity Room, we explore questions that are not often explored. And hopefully this time, curiosity doesn't kill anybody or worse, get us expelled. So if you are ready, we are going to dive in to the curiosity room. The first question is for Brett. Brett, you are fighting the good fight against content syndication. What is your gripe with content syndication? You know, I, I think I'll, I'll go back to, you know, f rewind the tape a little bit to, to earlier in my career. And I'd have, uh, you know, my boss or my boss's boss say, hey, you know, we have some extra budget that we want to, we can spend this quarter what, and we need more leads, um, go do it. And so for me, the easy thing was to call up my content syndication dealer, say, hey, I've got ten to $15,000. Let's run this content piece. Let's put it through your program. And at the end of it, I need leads. And so I think back on this experience and it was highly transactional it was transactional, and it was focused on quantity. So I get this CSV file that was just a bunch of names that did something that some third party vendor um, did with our content. And I'd upload them into our sales force and then I would distribute them out to sales. And then I'd say, my job's done here. Um, and I'd go move on to the next project. I'd be happy because I hit my KPIs and likely my my bonus but then sales wouldn't be because they'd say these leads are terrible what are we doing in marketing and then looking back on it now what i didn't realize at the time was just the overwhelming brand damage that you know this would this sort of campaign um would do for anything that our content and brand team was building so i believe there's a better way and i think um, we're working on that at the juice and i think it really centers around this topic uh, around content syndication and or content distribution and identifying, researching, spending time, um, learning where your future customers go hang out to grow and learn and be active on those channels and deliver content on those channels in a way that's not spamming them, but is um, building relationships and helping answer their questions through the work that you and your team are uh, building and delivering. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting, Brett. And, and I think you are practicing what you preach. I've seen you, I've seen representative of the Jews um, try to be more valuable to the community rather than spamming people. So I really think you are walking the talk. And while we're on the topic of content distribution, why do you think it's a very powerful way to align marketing and sales teams through content? Yeah, so I think the first thing it does is it really changes the perspective from, okay, Let's not just focus on quantity and volume of leads and have that be our North Star, but let's really focus on quality. So it allows us to focus on accounts jointly that are in, that and people that share a similar perspective for what our brand is building. And um, that's that's what I think it does. And I, I really like um, the opportunity in just being a learner and being someone who's curious of going into those channels and meeting people. And we're in the stage in B2B where everyone's got a commodity, everyone's got something shiny that's bigger, faster than everybody else. And I think people want to buy from people. So distribution allows you to connect at the individual level. And I believe that's where we're trending and where more of us will be going um, in marketing. And I think the brands who are doing it actively and who are really good at it now are running laps around their competition. And there's the ones that are continue to gain more market share and continue to post uh, fundraising updates and everything they talk about is growth. And that's, I think it's because they're leveraging their individuals as their number one distribution channel. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And what are a few of your favorite brands that are doing this right, Brett? Yeah, so I think uh, I'll call out um, some individuals. So I think one, I love what Nick Bennett is doing at Alice. I mm -hmm. think um, he has done a phenomenal job of building his individual brand. And then on the other side of that, I'm sitting up here uh, plugging Alice on a podcast that's going to be listened to uh, by a bunch of people just because of um, 
something that a, something that one of their individuals at their at their company is doing. So I think kind of the probably the case study right now that you'll you'll hear mentioned the most is um, Gong in their activation. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody knows Gong. Everybody knows what they do. Everybody knows people who work at Gong um, because they are habitual with their sharing of thoughts, ideas, perspective, and content. So those are a couple. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. And it's very interesting you brought up Nick because Nick was a guest at one of our previous flagship events called Unmute. So Nick, if you're hearing this, I hope you've heard all of the good words Brett has for you. And moving on, Chris, what is a common myth about content marketing that you wholeheartedly disagree with? So I think that the the idea of creation being the most important thing, like I can just build a lot of content. Um, As we talk to customers, uh, what we're finding is that content as a asset in the business isn't well understood, right? So how much, you know, our message is, you know, we can help you save time, effort, and money on the creation of your content. And the response is, um, cool, we don't spend any money on content. Content is a byproduct of people coming to work. Um, so businesses don't understand the asset. But once we get them to understand the asset, the thing that's missed, and it, it ties into what Brett's talking about, is content sitting on a desk doesn't do anything for you. The spend to create is only part of the process. The spend to get the content out through either a push or a pull mechanism is where all of this comes together. And so content by itself isn't the answer. It's content that's designed to resonate with the audience, content that's designed to create the action. So if the action is to create a purchase, it would be cool if it was one-to-one, right? So I create this neat piece of content or this interesting website and I put it out there and I pay a bunch of money to make sure that it's optimized. SEO, lots of keywords, fantastic. People are going to find it. Um, I spend a bunch of money to push it out through channels, advertising, social. It's out everywhere. If people come to it and nothing happens, that's a failure. That piece of content doesn't work. Just creating it doesn't solve the problem. The next piece of it is it's not as easy as that. It's not one piece of content that creates that action. It's dozens. Because think about, I mean, so we all have an Instagram. Um, and you see a pair of sneakers on Instagram. You've never heard of the brand before. Do you buy them? No, that's one touch point. You go to their website and you check and you look at some review sites and you watch a YouTube video and there's dozens of touch points that go into the action that's desired, that purchase. So this one thing, you said create a piece of content, I created a piece of content. That doesn't move the needle. It's this whole experience, this whole package of assets that drive decisions in the business all of them need to be aligned. All of them need to work together. All of them need to, to drive towards that final step. And it can't, it's not in order. I like to think in order. Like if you do this, then you do this, then you do this, then you do this, and this happens. But I started here. I don't know anything about anything that happened here. You need, you need to progressively build, but you also need to fill in the gaps every piece of content that you build to create that final action. So the idea of creating is great. But that's not the thing. It's the planning, it's the strategy that goes around each piece of content to ensure that it's going to have the impact that you expect it to have. Love that breakdown, Chris. And it's very interesting that you mentioned results, right? Because honestly, what I think right now is in the pursuit of proving content's ROI, a lot of marketers are settling for mediocrity and short-term hacks, um, right? So what do you have to tell about that, Chris? Well, I mean, like I said, every piece of every lead that we generate, every deal that goes into the pipeline comes from content at some point. So when I think about what we're here to do uh, and the way that my team is measured, they're they're measured on pipeline. Um, They're a content group. They create things. They it's pretty pictures and words, but they're still as much a part of our, our revenue engine as any other part of marketing because they're that fuel that we're throwing on the demand gen fire to make sure that we're getting output, that things are happening. Um, Also, the idea of getting that team to think beyond just the simple piece. It's not just creating product pieces. It's not just creating webinar content. It's creating useful action in the form of content that's gonna drive a deal. An example, we found that we were selling, we were meeting at the lead stage, a lot of practitioners, people that would use our product. That's awesome because they feel the pain, right? They get 
what we're trying to solve for them. They're excited about it. But these folks don't know how to buy software. They're not software buyers. They're not enterprise software buyers. They might not even know somebody that does that. So we're getting to a point in the funnel where things stop because this person's ability to influence the purchase of a sale ends. What do we do? Let's throw some content at it. Not about us. It's not about our product. It's not to sell Acrolinks. It's to help educate somebody as a part of our funnel to help move them to the next stage, make them better, make them more successful, allow them to get what they need. It's not just a self-serving tell our story. Solving people's business problems is what drives the usage of your content and the conversion from there. And, and the purpose of that piece of content is to see funnel movement. So we can measure that. Like that one piece of content is designed to see deals move from discovery to business alignment. If deals move from uh, discovery to business alignment as a result of seeing that content, we see success in that piece of content. It has a desired result and there is an expected impact. Mm -hmm. Love that, Chris. Brett, do you have anything to add on to what Chris just said? No, I just love um, Chris's point of view because I think um, kind of what was woven throughout both of his responses, I think, is just um, the importance of end-to-end -end customer experience and the role content plays in that process, which I think, you know, when I, when I first started in B2B marketing, content marketing was was a new thing. And, you know, we'd hire, t we'd hire one content marketer and they'd sit in isolation pumping out pieces of content to hit algorithms and feed keywords and get people to become, come to your website. And it was just this transactional exchange. And I think now more and more content marketing is becoming such a strategic part of not only marketing teams, but businesses in general, because it, it is that, it is that, uh, that, uh, focal point for your brand. And it is that piece that connects each, um, each link in the customer experience process that you are trying to build. So that's just something that triggered in my head. And I thought was interesting is just like the importance of customer experience. And then on top of that, how, how content plays a role in making, uh, creating a better experience from start to finish. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, yes, exactly. And if you think about, I mean, the way that it moves beyond marketing even. So there's a customer journey. We've been selling, I mean, I'm sure that you and I have both been selling the digital shift, fear, uncertainty, and doubt for the last decade. And then in March of 2020, it, it arrived. And now your touch points are only digital. And it's not just the marketing material. It's not just the sales stuff. It's not just the website. It starts with the product. And the user strings in the product or the um the um the words that are built into the software it's the technical documentation it's the product manuals it's the education content move into marketing and the way that you sell it and communicate it move into post sales and service and support content and all of that has to be essentially one thing one global voice hierarchy at the top we spell the name of the company right that's where we start and we drop down into how we speak from a technical standpoint how we speak from a marketing standpoint how we speak from a support standpoint but it all ties together so this idea of individual silos of content starts to have to shift because it's not i'm not different in marketing i can't be different in marketing than what we are in product than what we are in service and support, with the exception of like tone of voice. I can sound different in marketing. We can be fun in marketing and not be fun in service, but we still use the same rules. And businesses still don't understand that. It's still siloed. You're still talking to this fiefdom of content over here that has no contact with these folks over here and nothing in between. And it's, it's remarkable because these are businesses that know better, they understand the value of their brand, they understand the value of their public appearance, and yet they're disconnected across their process. Sorry, I'm hijacking, I do that. <laughs> well, it is worth <laughs> listening to that, so I hope Brett doesn't mind. And with that, we're kind of moving on to the next segment of the show, which is called Explain Like I'm Five. Right. Fans of The Office know how this ends, but for everybody else, this is a segment where even the most complex marketing terms are forced to be broken down into terms that a five-year-old can understand. So Brett and Chris, you will both get a marketing term 
and you've got to explain oh it to me like I'm five. Are you ready? No, I don't know. <laughs> me, neither, me neither. We can try this. <laughs> well, it's still not too late to run away, but I'm going to trust you. I'm going to do that, and I'm going to kick this off by asking Brett. How do you explain what commodity content is like I'm a five year old? Yeah, so um, when you are walking down the aisle at your favorite toy store, you start to see, especially if you're in, you know, looking at action figures, you're starting to see the same packaging, you're starting to see the same bubbles and it all is this over uniform, you're walking, you're walking, and none of that really gets your attention or stops you in your tracks. But it makes up the majority of what's on the aisle, especially when you're trying to find something that you're looking for, for, you know, potentially a birthday gift. Um, I think that is uh, the structure of what we see today in B2B content is most of the same thing. It is people structuring their articles in a certain way, putting keywords in a certain way to hit algorithms and to get people to come find them when they're searching on Google. Um, and so I think that commodity content would be that just the stuff that we see as individuals that we know it when we see it and we know it's part of this um, system of content that we're used to and probably think is likely boring. So I would say that you know, it would be if I was talking to a five year old, it would be the, the, the not so fun toys that you're seeing down the aisle that don't catch your attention. Mm -hmm. Love that, Brett. And I'd like to believe I was a smart five year old and I would understand what that meant. Moving on to Chris. Chris, how do you explain what a linguistic analytics engine is to a five year old? <laughs> <laughs> I really hope you don't regret agreeing to be on this show, but uh, where's the off button? Um, okay. Um, you know how you have blocks that you play with that are different colors and shapes? Uh, ling linguistics AI engine is going to help you to first identify what blocks you have in front of you and then what those blocks are designed to to do? Are they square? Are they round? Are they rectangular? Then they're going to start taking them and placing them into the boxes, the holes that they go in. I'm not sure if I'm going in the right direction. I'm trying to get to tokenization. <laughs> um, oh boy. Um, and then it's going to come back and tell you without you having to look at what all those shapes are, where those shapes go and ho how those shapes are used. I hope you're a really smart five-year-old. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope so too. Explain nuclear fission to me, but like I'm a five year old. Oh, poison. <laughs> no, I don't think that is Theater a bad degree. attempt, Chris. I think that is a pretty good attempt at it. Um, and with that, we are moving on to the final and my Thank favorite God. segment <laughs> <laughs> of the show. And this one's called Rapid Fire. Are you ready? Is this where you just throw things at us? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want to do that right now, but you will find out eventually. So okay. if you are ready, gentlemen, can we get started with rapid fire? Mm. Let's, let's try this. All right. Brett, do you want to go first or do you want to let Chris go first this time? I'll go. <laughs> okay. I'm ready. I'm ready. All right. All right. So Brett. Blank is something you consider a marketing sin. Uh, content syndication. <laughs> okay, I see what you did there. The next question of rapid fire. You've punched at least one person who says digital music is better than physical music. 
I'm probably going to have to walk away from that one because I, I'm. It's going to be. It, it'd be like ex- trying to explain uh, physical music to a, a, a five year old, and it probably wouldn't resonate. So I'd probably just walk in the other direction instead of uh, battling that one. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. The next question to you, Brett, is: It takes an all star team and an expensive budget to build a world class content repository. Do you agree or not? I think that's helpful, but I think there's um, if if you have the right uh, of, of the right people, like even if it's uh, a couple people that are like minded and understand um, your point of view and are very good at creation, you can create a perception in the market that your brand and your and what you're building is a lot more advanced than where you are. So I think. If you've got the right creators, um, your team of two can look like a team of 20, and therefore the market will think that you're a company that's been around a lot longer than you probably have. Mm -hmm. Love that. What is a content trend that you refuse to jump on, Brett? I think this idea of influencer marketing, um, you know, I think what, what you see when people focus on influencer marketing is you start to see the same names, the same voices, and the same people on everything. And to me, that gets really boring. I think um, this idea of collaboration is more exciting when you're able to do the research and find people that are like-minded or are subject matter experts on things your company does or um, points of view your company has in aligning with those people and creating with them. I think that to me resonates a lot more than um, quote unquote influencer marketing, where it's just the same voices and the same people um, over and over again. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. I hope you're relieved because this brings us to the last question of rapid fire. What's something that hasn't taken off yet, but you really believe will take off in the marketing world? I think it's the this idea of spending way more time than we are as marketers in activating our internal teams um, before we go out and start activating externally. I think the brands that are uh, leveling up and running past their competition are those that are experts at internal marketing and internal activation and creating um, distribution channels through their team. And so, like I mentioned previously, there are companies that are doing this, but I think we're just scratching the surface on this. Um, And it's marketing from the inside out. And the more that brands and businesses learn how to do this and actually spend time doing this, even at an early stage, um, the more they will win in the long run. Mm -hmm. Take a bow, Brett, because you've successfully survived this episode with the last question. Chris, Good luck, Chris. Are we ready? <laughs> sure. All right. This is your first question of rapid fire. You would rather be a blank than a marketer. I mean, if I was a better salesperson, I'd rather be a salesperson. I'd make more money. <laughs> but if I was a good salesperson, I guess I'd be one. Uh huh. Fair enough. Moving on to the next question. I think this is pretty interesting coming from you. What do you think should be the North Star metric for content teams? Uh, Revenue. Uh, I mean, that's what all of this comes back to. It doesn't matter what the content is. Again, whether it's product content, which is aiming towards uh, product usage, uh, customer adoption, retention, or if it's marketing content that's leading towards the funnel, pipeline, and sales, or it's service and support, which again is leaning on retention and renewal, all of this is designed to generate revenue. Fantastic. You've spoken a lot about tone of voice today, Chris. So what is something you wish more brands knew when it comes to tone of voice? That they have an audience and there are ways to create content that resonates with that audience. I mean, depending on what you do and who you do it for, the way that you communicate matters. So take a drug company, for instance, and the way that you market the same medicine to a nursing mother and a 55-year-old guy are different. They have to be. You can't just call it, I don't know, Sky Muzzy or something and push it out on TV and everybody's going to take it. There's a way to, to 
romance your audience to speak to them in their voice and doing that creates more impact it creates better engagement and it creates again a better pathway to revenue and we don't necessarily think that way and the flip side of that is it's not you know like i said it's not one thing so you can't just build one model and hope that it works for everybody it's communicating across that channel using this hierarchical model that says you know again we we all spell the name of the company, right? But from there, I talk to you like this, I talk to you like this, I segment this out, and I can manage this. When you look at authoring assistant software out in the mass market today, language is generic. It's one thing. Uh, it, correctness, grammar, spelling is this commodity play of one thing. But that's not how enterprises communicate. And that's that's where they fall down right now is trying to use language like it's a thing, like it's generic, like it's the same thing for everybody. And it's not. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. <laughs> I think the timing of this question is very good because who no, is no. somebody you trade lives with right now, Chris? Oh, um, I feel like everybody that I could pick is dangerous. Um, Nope, I got one. Paul McCartney. Think about how great that dude's life must be, right? I mean, he's a beetle. He's in his, what, late 70s. He just gets to hang out. He's a knight. Um, that, I, Paul McCartney, I think. He, and he, nobody dislikes Paul McCartney. There's not a bunch of people protesting him right now. <laughs> All right. Well, I don't think you've got a way to trade lives anymore because we've come to the end of this show. And this is your last question, Chris. What's something that you wish takes off in a really big way in the marketing world? <laughs> That's easy. It's very self-serving. Uh, the idea of managing content impact. So the, the creation of content, again, isn't enough. The, the drive to make that content deliver its business purpose needs to be embedded in the process. And there is a number of technologies it happens that one mine is one of them but it's not the only one that help businesses drive this impact into their content and see measurable results it's interesting when you look back three or four years at the linguistic software that existed it really was about correctness we're going to make better content but better content on its own doesn't solve the business problem and now there's this whole crop of businesses that have this end result of better business results, better impact from content. And that's the thing that I want to see move uh, the fastest right now. Fantastic. Um, with that, I think we've reached the end of this episode of Kappa Press. Thank you so much, Chris and Brett, for being such good sports and for really being here. Really grateful to have you here. My Apple Watch thinks I've been exercising because of my heart rate. <laughs> um. <laughs> Well, I apologize for that. But honestly, thank you so much. I hope you had a good time because I had a blast of a time. This is very now, fun. Thank you. I, yeah, t a lot of fun. Thank you. And now, Chris, all I can think about is just how awesome it would be to be Paul McCartney right about now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, thank you so much.